big. The big topic is something called conditional probability, which is actually really common, but it's kind of hidden. We don't always see it coming. So a conditional probability is when you just ask, what's the probability of something happened given that we have prior knowledge about something? I kind of call it kind of insider trading. I know something else happened and that can affect my probability. So for those who are gamblers, this is the, the mathematics of card counting. We're not going to do that particularly. That's a bit complicated. So here's the question, okay? You roll a pair of fair dice. All right, let's keep it simple. Find the probability Hold on one second. I'm, I'm waiting for a call. Let me, let me pause this. Very good news. My car has been in the shop and I talk about fingers crossed. I didn't know. And that was the mechanic called and said, your car is running well. It's working. Everything's great. And <laughs> it, my car uh, has not been running well. And over the weekend, all of the lights came on. I mean, the check engine, every orange light that could possibly come on came on. <laughs> So this was very good news. <laughs> anyway, all right, you roll a pair of fair dice, find the probability the sum is, let's say, at least, we'll keep it simple, it's at least eight, all right? So what I want to do is quickly generate the table because I'm going to use the table to answer the question. When I mean the table, the dice roll chart. Now, all I have to do is look at the dice roll chart to determine which of the rolls, okay? So if the question is, what's the probability the sum is at least nine, that means nine or, excuse, excuse me, at least eight, then my answer clearly will come from that region right there. My sample space is 36 rolls. The particular event I'm looking at, let me just count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 30, 40, 15. Okay, so does everybody agree the answer is pretty obvious? The answer is going to be 15 over 36. Okay. Now, that wasn't too bad. No, I could have a I could have all sorts of tables, I could have all sorts of ways of calculating. That's that's fine. But here's the thing. Okay, my wife and I play backgammon all the time. And you know, we put the little the dice in the little shaker thing. And sometimes one of the they don't come out together. Sometimes one will fall out and you know, you gotta wait a second, you know, and then the other one will fall out. Well, when one falls out, I see one, what one of the dice is. So here's what's happening. I'm I'm rolling the dice and I'm not paying much attention, and one of the dice flies out of my hand before I'm done rolling. And you saw that that one die hit the ground. Okay. You saw one of the dice hit the ground and you saw one of the dice is a five. You know, I, I wasn't paying attention. Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe we're playing, you know, we're doing like we did last day, trying to play a fair game with dice. And you saw one of the dice is a five. And the question is still the same. What's the probability that my sum is at least eight? Does it change if you know one of the dice is a five? Anybody want to try that one? Does it change? Because this really is the whole point of today's class. You want to try it? Do you think the probability will change if you know one of the dice is a five? It's a yes or no question. Yeah, you don't have to explain. Nobody wants to try that one? <laughs> I guess we're done then. <laughs> hmm. All right, let me ask you this different question. What's the probability the sum is at least an eight if you know one of the dice landed a one? Anybody want to try that one? What's the probability the sum is at least eight if you know one of the dice landed a one? Zero. How come? Because the math is six. 
Yeah, if, if one of the dice landed a one, you can't get a total of eight. There are no sevens. Oh, so if knowing what one of the dice is, okay, so now the question is, if I know one of the dice landed a five, is that going to change my probability? Is it still going to be 15 over 36? Well, you, Zach just said it was zero if I knew one of the dice was a one, because you can't get a total of eight. So does the prior knowledge make a difference? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, it's the single most important part of the problem, not the eight. The prior knowledge, because the prior knowledge, knowing one of my dice is a five, changes the sample space. If you know one of the dice is a five, then is one one a possible outcome anymore? No. The only possible outcomes are outcomes that have fives in them. And that would be, let me try out the right row here. There we go. Those are the only possible outcomes now. Oh, that changed everything. If I have prior knowledge, what changes is the sample space. So a moment ago when I said, well, what if one of my, what if I knew one of the dice was a one, then your sample space would be these outer edges and not one of those will add up to eight or more. Now my sample space is these 11 rolls. And which of these 11 rolls have a total of eight or more? I'll circle them. That one, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. In fact, most of them. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. My probability went from 15 over 36, which is less than 0.5, to seven over 11, which is much more than 0.5. Hmm. So having the prior knowledge was huge. And that, was, that made a huge difference in my final answer. So this is what conditional probability is. I know how to calculate the probability of a particular event, period, right? The, the number of outcomes of that event divided by the number of outcomes in the sample space, assuming they're all equally likely events, or excuse me, equally likely outcomes, like in the dice roll. But if I knew something happened, that may change the sample space. Okay, and if that's the case, then I got a different answer. So now the question is, how do I come up with this as a formula? How do I make this a formal mathematical statement? So let's still let's stick on this problem here. The question is, how did we get from the original problem being 15 over 36 to this answer here by me throwing in the one condition? So first of all, from a notation standpoint, okay, let's say we have A and B are events. We know how to calculate the probability of event A. We know how to calculate the probability of event B. We, we've been doing that. So here's what conditional probability is. The probability of event A given event B. This is a vertical bar. This is not a quotient. A vertical bar in mathematics always has a very specific meaning. And I, I, make, I laugh because as a math instructor, I'd say 99.97% of the time I see a vertical bar it's a student writing a fraction because they don't understand that a vertical bar in no way indicates there's a fraction like ever. And now that we know divisibility rules, we realize, oh my God, when you write a vertical bar, you've actually, yeah, never use a vertical bar for fraction. That's just, that's beyond bad math. It, it actually always means something different. This says, what is the probability of event A occurring given that event B has occurred? Huh, well, if event B has occurred, that means my sample space is only event B. Ah, the sample space is only event B. So a moment ago, I said, what's the probability of rolling a sum of at least eight, given that we knew one of the dice was a five? So my sample space was only the events where the dice was a five. So in this case here, let's call it, let's start with event B. Event B would be the, let's say the, um, the rolls with, fives. <laughs> okay, let me make my five look different than my S. Okay, that's, that's event B, all the rolls that have fives in them. So then what would A be? Well, the, I wanted to know that my sum was at least eight. So is A the sums of at least eight? Well, not exactly, not exactly. Okay, is it the sums of at least eight? Well, if I just said, what's the probability of this given this, then I need the sums of at least eight that also have a five in them. That's where my numerator came from. So I'm looking at the things that these happen simultaneously. 
when that, these happened simultaneously, we just calculated there were seven rolls. There were exactly seven rolls where those happened simultaneously, and there were 15 rolls involved in B. So it turns out, looks like this. The sums of at least eight that have a five in them, that's the circled numbers, the rolls that have fives in them. So if we calculate those as independent probabilities, then what we see is, well, in this case, the probability of A intersect B, okay? We said there were seven rolls. That would be seven out of 36 of my rolls. Just, I'm rolling the dice. What's the probability that I have a sum of at least eight and that one of the dice is a five? Of my 36 rolls, that's seven of them. Now, what's the probability that I have a roll that has a five in it? So of the 36 rolls, I said, sorry, um, 11. I, I said, I think I said 15, sorry, 11. So seven over 36 over 11 over 36, there's our seven over 11. That's where it came from. Now, this formula is, is a very simple formula to use and it, it beats drawing the picture and having to go through every outcome because I can only do this with the dice roll because my sample space was originally only 36 rolls. What if your sample space is large? See, you can't afford to write down every possible outcome. So what you have to do is set it up in this manner. So it turns out that the formula for conditional probability is actually quite simple because we should know all of the parts involved, okay? So let's do a few examples of this just so we can see how it works. Now, let's say recently, we, we did a very important poll in San Diego. You know, we did a very important poll and we, we, we polled all, San, we polled San Diegans, thousands of them and asked them some very, very important questions, right? Not COVID, no, not political. We asked them, first question is, okay, whoops. A is that they go to the beach, go to the beach regularly regularly and b let's say is the event they are still chargers fans okay so we, we really needed to know these very very important questions so we went around and asked people do you go to the beach regularly the answer is yes or it's no keep it simple we said are you still a chargers fan whether you were or not are you a chargers fan the answer is yes or no now can a person go to the beach and not be a chargers fan Yes. Can they be a Chargers fan and not go to the beach? Yes. Can they be both? Yes. Can they be neither? Of course. Okay. So what we did was we collected this in really, really important information. And we found that the probability of being an A, uh, you're, you're a San Diego, let's say that number was 0.6. Let's say the probability of B was only 0.4. And let's say that um, the people that identified in both groups, let's just say is 0.3, okay? Now, the first thing I'd like to do is let's draw a Venn diagram because a lot of times this is much easier when I have a visual. And the nice thing is, unlike the dice roll where I could list every outcome, this outcome might involve hundreds of thousands of people. So I'm not gonna list every possibility, but if I draw the Venn diagram, then all I need are the probabilities. So event A, that was beachgoers. Event B, that was Charger fans, and there's definitely an intersection. So when I'm filling in the numbers, does anyone remember how to do this? There's only one correct way to fill in the numbers. There aren't versions. What must be the first step? Anyone want to try that one? If I want to get it right, what must be the first step? Do, do I put, let me ask you, do I, do I put this? Is this correct? <laughs> Anybody? Is, is that is that gonna work? Anybody? No? Yes. You guys are all sleeping today. No. Why not? Because then it's PA equals 0.9 and well, like oh, okay, so, well, simple as it adds up to more than one. <laughs> That's <the first> one. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, you, you, you hear about people giving 110 percent. I guess this is how it worked. You know, I <laughs> no, that's not going to work. So when I'm filling it in, is there an order of things? Yes. You have to put in the intersection first, period. There's no, no gray area there. Ah, now if 60% of all San Diegans fall in the A bubble, 30% of them have already fallen in the intersection. So therefore, who's out here? Another 0.3. Ah, so 40% of San Diegans fall in the B bubble, then there must be 0.1. So how many... What percentage of San Diegans are neither beachgoers nor Charger fans? Anybody? Neither beachgoers nor Charger fans. What do you think? Well, what's left? Point three. Point three. Yeah. I'm using nice, happy numbers. All right. I've now filled it in. Okay. This point three represents what's the probability you're a beachgoer and not a Charger fan. Point one would be you're a Charger fan and not a beachgoer. Point three is you're both, and over here, I probably should use different numbers, but that's okay. All right, now I'm gonna grab a person at random who's, who's been pulled. So my question is, find the probability That a, I'll call them beachgoers. I like that term. That a beachgoer is not a Charger fan. Hmm. So then we need, what am I asking in terms of conditional probability? I'm saying, what is the probability that you're a beachgoer given you're not a Charger fan? Or I could be saying, what's the probability you're not a Charger fan given that you're a beachgoer? Which do I know? Before, before I ask the question, do I know you're a beachgoer or do I know about your being a Charger fan? Find the probability a that a beachgoer. Yeah, I, I'm asking a beachgoer. I'm not asking about, I'm not asking a Charger fan or not a Charger fan. I'm saying, I'm going to grab a beachgoer. What's the probability they're not a Charger fan? So what's the given in this case? The given would be they're a beachgoer. That's very important. I realize that. So the question is, find the probability that a beachgoer, so I want the probability given somebody's a beachgoer. They're not a Charger fan. Well, Charger fans are the B, so not a Charger fan. Um, B bar, B complement, I, I don't really care notation wise. Textbooks vary, either one. You could say B bar or B complement. So this would be the probability of A intersect B complement over the probability of A. That means my denominator in this problem is going to be 0.6. So now what's the intersection what is the intersection of beachgoers and non-Charger fans? Well, non-Charger fans would be everything outside of the circle, okay? All people outside of the circle, which would be those folks there, those folks there. Those are the non-Charger fans, okay? I want the intersection of the beachgoers and the non-Charger fans. That would be that. So right now we are at 0.3 over 0 0.6. And that answer would simply be one half. The probability that a beachgoer is not a Charger fan. Okay, that makes sense. Because if you think about it this way, aren't half the beachgoers in this circle and the other half of the beachgoers are in this circle? That makes sense. But I'm not using the Venn diagram to answer that question. I'm just using the probabilities. I could change the question. What's the probability now a Charger fan is also a beachgoer? What's the probability that you are neither given that you're not a Charger fan? On and on and on and on, you could ask the questions and all you're doing is using the same probabilities over and over again. Clearly the probability of non-beachgoers would be 0.4, right? You just think complements. So conditional probability is not a hard thing to calculate. But what's very important is you have to realize, okay, what is my given? Because my given becomes the sample space, okay? Now, this leads to a very important definition. 
Okay, going now going back to the generic formula that we just derived or we just did, the probability of A given B is the probability of A intersect B over the probability of B. This is always true. Now, a common error in statistics and in discrete math is that people try to calculate intersections. And that's always a dangerous thing. And, and most in most every situation that exists, an intersection is to, you just count how many how many things are in the intersection. A moment ago, I just said we did a poll of San Diegans and we asked, are you a are you a beachgoer? Yes or no. Are you a Charger fan? Yes or no. And if you said yes to both, now you're in the intersection. I told you what the intersection was. I didn't calculate the intersection. I simply counted the intersection. That's not the same thing. There is no such thing as a formula to calculate intersection. But I see people do it all the time. I've, I've taught stats for years and years and years. And one of the most common errors is that people will calculate an intersection because they're sure they saw a formula somewhere that didn't exist. You see, if I wanted to isolate the intersection, the intersection would be the probability of A given B times the probability of B. Okay, that, that's clearly an identity. But the thing is, I usually don't know this piece. I usually have to calculate that piece. Or I, in other words, I have, to, I have to get that piece somewhere else. That's usually not known ahead of time. But I mean, it could be. Now, whoops, sorry. By the way, the most common error is that people will just simply multiply probabilities to get an intersection, which will be wrong more than 99% of the time. I mean, it's, it's almost always wrong. But what if? What if? The probability of A given B was equal to the probability of A. I'm going to roll the dice. Okay. I want to, I'm going to roll the dice. And I can ask a similar question. What's the probability that my total is at least eight given? Ah, oh, I know how to do this one. What's the probability that my total is at least eight given one of the dice is an even number? In other words, one of the dice is a two, a four, or a six. Well, it turns out it's going to be the same answer as it was before. All right. I'd like to know, what is the probability? I'm going to flip a coin. What is the probability it lands heads given that I had eggs for breakfast? Hmm. <laughs> Having eggs for breakfast probably isn't going to affect the probability of my coin landing. Hmm. So... If I ask a question, what's the probability of event A occurring given that event B has occurred? What happens if you just get the same thing as the probability of A occurring? That means that B did not have any impact on it in a sense. Oh, if this is true, by definitions, we would say that A and B are, and this is the word, independent events. If the probability, if the conditional probability is the same as the non-conditional probability, then they're called independent events. In a sense, it means one will not affect the probability of the other. Now, if this is the case, then go to this formula right here. Oh, if this is equal to this, then we can conclude that the probability of the intersection is simply the product of the probabilities. Now, of the infinitely many probabilistic models you could come up with, this is going to happen close to zero. <laughs> it's very, very close to zero in general, but it can happen. The mistake that most people make is they say, this is a formula that is always true. No, I could come up with examples and tell the you know sun dries up at Witten where it's never true. <laughs> and try doing dice rolls and no, it's not gonna. No, this is not true in general. This is true if these are independent events because I just swapped this out. So therefore, this is a really good test to determine whether two events are independent or not. Ah, so let's do another simple example. All right, and, and I'm just making up the numbers. I don't know if it's true or not. Let's suppose at Mesa College, at Mesa College, let's say that 60% um, of the students are enrolled, oops, 
in math, as they should be. Let's say that 50% um, of the students are enrolled in English. Let's say that 40% um, of the students are enrolled, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in, in a lab science. Let's say that um, 23, uh, I'll use a nice number, 20% are enrolled in both math and English. Twenty, let's say twenty four percent are enrolled in math and lab science. Okay, I don't need a Venn diagram in this case because I'm not going to tell you the three way intersection or even the lab science in English, but I'm giving you this much information. So now you got to look at the givens. Now, this is where I would use percentage. You know, 60% of my students are in math. So, therefore, if a student is grabbed at random, what is the probability they're in math? That would be 0.6. You don't see the probability is 60%. That's, that's a completely misuse of the word, you know, percent. No, 60% of the students are enrolled in math. So the probability of students enrolled in math is 0 0.6. Okay. Now with that and that and that and that and that, we need to identify now the events. <clears throat> so let's make it really simple. Let's say M is the event that you're enrolled in math. E is the event you rolled in English. And let's say L is the event you rolled in a lab science. Okay. So then the probability of, I'll use a different color here, sorry. The probability of M that's the 0 0.6. The probability of E, and I'll, I'll use two decimals because some of those are two, is. 0 0.5, the probability of L is 0 0.4. The probability of, now I said math and English is 0 0.2. The probability of math and lab science is 0 0.24. Now we can start asking some conditional probability questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and erase this because I've got all the numbers now. <clears throat> Now it's extremely important that I, you know, that I get this part right because that's given. I not I didn't do a single calculation. So first question: Find the probability a math student is enrolled in a English. B, lab science. So I'm going to grab a math student at random. So now in other words, I know they're a math student. That's not the question. What's the probability that student is also enrolled in English? What is the probability that student is also enrolled in lab science? Two completely separate questions. Okay. So what am I asking here? The first question is, what is the probability that a student is enrolled in English given they're enrolled in math. I'm grabbing a math student. See, that's not the question. I'm not saying, well, what's the probability they're in math? No, they, they are in math. What's the probability they're in English? That's sometimes the hardest part of the translation. I have a math student. What's the probability they're in English? I have a math student. What's the probability they're in lab science? Everybody see that? That's what I'm asking. So in the first case, the answer is the probability of math intersect English. And by the way, 
It doesn't matter if you say English intersect math or math intersect English. We know the intersection is commutative, so it doesn't matter what order you write it. But I wrote it this way down here. Over the probability of math. Okay, now what would that be? Well, let's see. Probability of the intersection was 0 0.2. The probability of being in math was 0 0.6. So that's exactly one third. So what's the probability an English student is also, excuse me, what, what's the probability of being in English given that you're in math? Or in other words, what's the probability of any given math student being in an English class is one third. Now the second question, uh, oops. This would be the probability of math intersect lab science over the probability of math. Now, 0 0.24 over 0 0.6. And that's exactly 0 0.4. Does anybody notice anything interesting about that particular answer? I'm hoping you notice something interesting about that particular answer. The probability you're in a lab, given that you're in math. It's all the students who take just the lab. But, but compared to the numbers, what's the probability that you're, you're enrolled in a lab science given that you're a math student? I already know you're a math student. What's the probability you're enrolled in a lab science given you're a math student? We just calculated it. Do you notice anything interesting? So basically all lab students are math students. Mm, no, no. No, only 24% are in both. But what does this mean? The probability of being in a lab, given that you're in math, was exactly the same as the probability that you're in a lab in general, whether you were in math or not. These were the same. Does everybody see that? That the probability of being in a lab, given that you were in math, was exactly the same as the probability you were being in math, whether I knew that or not. That means that these two events, math and lab, are independent of each other. Another way of thinking about that is 24% of the students are in a lab, whether they're in math or not. Oh, so what about the, the you're in math, you're in math. I didn't tell you the, the English intersection, but if I wrote, can I fit this in here? Yeah, I can fit this in here. Now I want to draw the Venn diagram for math and lab, because that'll make it a little bit easier for everybody to see. English and math clearly are not independent. By the way, not independent is dependent. The vast majority of all events that could possibly occur are actually dependent. Knowing what happens in one case does actually affect what happens in the other most all the time, even if it doesn't seem like it would. So here's math, here's lab. I had an intersection of 0.24, okay? The total in math was 0.6, so that would be 0.36. The total here would be 0.16, okay? Now, what's left? I believe that would be 0.24 out here if I, do, if I just add this, four, yeah, okay. So if I said, what's the probability you're in a lab Oops, did I just mess it? No, that's right. What's the probability you're in a lab? 0.4. What's the probability you're in math? 0.6. Now, I'm going to grab somebody in math. What's the probability that they are taking lab given they're in math? Well, it'd be that number, 0.24, divided by the whole. That's what we just did. Now, what if I took somebody who's not in math? Well, who's not in math? Everybody outside this circle is not in math, okay? So what's the probability you're in a lab given that you're not in math? Huh, well, not in math would be 0.4. Do you all agree with that? What's the probability you're in a lab and you're not in math? Well, if 0.4 is the people that are not in math, 0.16 are people that are in a lab and not in math. That'd be 0.16. Those are the people that are in a lab and not in math. 0.4 was my sample space, all the people that are not in math. And by the way, what does that come out to be? 
the same 0.4. Okay, so I'm getting 40%. If math is involved, I'm getting, I'm getting this number. If the probability you're in a lab is 0.4, and we've just determined that being in math and being lab are independent of each other, that means knowing that I'm in math, knowing that I'm not in math, it was still 40%. It didn't make any difference. I'm, another way of thinking about it is knowing that I'm in math did not make you more likely to be in a lab. Okay, but with English, think of it another way. 50% of the people were in English, but only one third of the math people are in English. So knowing I'm in math made me far less likely to be in English in this case, only one third. So I'd say the events being in math and being in English are highly dependent because knowing that I was in math had a huge effect on the probability. That, that's not 0.5, but that was what the English probability was. Another way of thinking about knowing I'm not in math then would make me far more likely to be in English, okay, if I'm looking at it that way. So another way, if I started this problem by simply asking the question, are the events being in math and being in, in a lab science, are those events independent or dependent? Well, what you could do is do what I just did here. Let me, let me go ahead and erase this again. You just did a calculation a moment ago. You did the probability of being in a lab given you're in math, and you proved that was equal to the probability of being in a lab. Boom. That's the definition of independence. So you could say, okay, these two events, being in lab and being in math, are independent of each other. Because knowing that I was in math didn't affect the probability. But another way you could look at it is, what is the probability of being in math times the probability of being in lab? Well, that was 0 0.6 times 0 0.4, which is 0.24, which turns out to be the probability of the intersection. I didn't calculate the probability of the intersection. I was given the probability of the intersection. But what I did was I compared this product to this given value, and they turned out to be the same. Ah, now, by the way, look at math and English. If you multiply the probability of being in math by the probability of being in English, you get 0.3. The intersection has a probability of 0.2. Those are not equal. Is the probability of math and being in math and English independent or dependent? Anybody? I mean, I've already said it, but if I ask the question, are, are the events being in math and being in English, are those independent or dependent? What do you think? It's only two choices, so, you know, dependent. And why are they dependent? Because the product of these two probabilities does not equal the probability of the intersection. By the way, and that's the vast majority of cases in reality. The probability of the individual events rarely will equal the problem, the probability of the intersection. But when the probability of the individual events does equal the probability of the intersection. That means that they are independent because it means that this was a true statement. And that's the, the simplest test of all. So conditional probability is actually quite huge. This is used all the time. Now, I mentioned card counting. Now, let's just pretend we have an overly simplified case. All right. So Cynthia and I are going to play blackjack, but just two of us. We're going to play poker, but just the two of us. I mean, you know, it's probably not very realistic. So as we're playing and cards are being used, and you know, every time we're done with a hand, we expose our cards, let's suppose, and then those cards are set aside. Well, then I don't have 52 cards in the deck on the next hand. And so, you know, I, I need an ace to make my card, my hand work. How many aces have been played so far? If no aces have been played, then the probability of me getting an ace is getting pretty good because there's not 52 cards anymore. If all the aces have been played, then the probability of me getting an ace is not very good at all because it'd be zero. <laughs> so when you're playing cards and you're aware of the cards that have already been played, that affects the probability of what's going to come because there are either fewer or more of those things compared to everything else. I have 52 cards. Every time cards are played, I have less than 52, so my denominator is constantly changing. But the cards that I need, if they haven't been played, are still available. If they have been played, they're not available. And that clearly affects probability. So that's, that's an overly simplified way of thinking of card counting, For if you guys are wondering what that is. Now, at a typical casino, and I have sat down at a blackjack table, they might play with 
six, seven, eight, nine, they, they play with many, many, many decks at one time and they shuffle them well. So if you're trying to keep track, well, if I've got six decks going, there's a lot of aces in those six decks. So having one ace played isn't going to have a huge effect. And the second thing is for card counting to work, you've got to get it all the way down to the, to the last cards. So what they do at a casino is maybe when they get halfway through these cards, they stop and reshuffle them again. That pretty much prevents you from gaining any advantage of knowing what's occurred because there are so many cards in the deck that knowing one card's being played or not being played is not going to have a major effect on probability, a very, very minor effect. So that's a way of kind of avoiding people being able to do that. But that does make sense if you're thinking about it, right? And you're playing Go Fish or you know something like that. You're playing any game, knowing what's happened will affect what's going to happen. Now, in terms of, of everything else, in terms of investing, in, in terms of all sorts of things, probabilities matter, okay? Um, let's just say you're an investor and you say, I want to invest in a certain thing. Well, yesterday on the news, <laughs> some major news just came out about that company, good or bad. So will that affect your choice of investing or not? Will that affect your ability to make money on that company? If I know that news, yeah. Now, let's suppose that news was privileged information that the public's not supposed to know that news, but you do know that news because you know an insider. You're Martha Stewart. Anybody know what that's called when you have that news that you're not supposed to news that you're not supposed to know? Insider trading. Insider trading, and you're going to prison for a really long time. Martha Stewart, one of the most famous TV personalities, went to prison. People forget that because she made millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars illegally on knowledge that she wasn't supposed to have. That's, that's why the government's really strict on that. It's, you can't have that kind of knowledge. It's an unfair advantage. Now, here's the thing. At the beginning of the pandemic, we knew that companies were going to try to come up with a vaccine. We knew this. So if you had been paying attention and were very wise, I obviously wasn't, I would have probably <laughs> pulled money out of the bank and started investing in Pfizer and Moderna. I mean, that would have just made sense if I knew they were going to be the ones that come out first, because the value of those companies, I don't know how much they went up. I'd say tenfold, more, more, I don't know. But if you had invested in those companies, you would have done really well. So what's the probability that you're going to do really well, given you know they were going to produce a vaccine? I mean, that would be huge. But what about a company that was trying to produce a vaccine and never did and spent all sorts of resources and never did? Well, that company might go under. So having prior knowledge in an investment standpoint, and I don't mean illegal prior knowledge, but just being aware um, would make a huge effect. So if my, my retirement planners had been on the ball, <laughs> they would have moved my retirement savings, you know, into those areas. And, you know, I'd be doing really well. I, I probably wouldn't be, or I'd be sitting on a beach somewhere, you know, sipping cool ones because I would have done so well. I have a very close friend whose wife was at Qualcomm. This is 20 years ago. And they used to pay uh, the Qualcomm employees. I guess if you were management at higher up, they would pay Qualcomm employees with stock benefits. Okay. I mean, my daughter worked for Starbucks for years and she has all sorts of stock that the company gives them after a certain time. And they, everybody else was selling their stock stuff, but she had some reason to believe it would be a good idea to hold on to it for a little longer. And she was no longer working for Qualcomm. And then their stock, I believe they, they split it twice. It like, so however many stocks they were, they split it and split it again. She made, I believe it was $18 million in one day because she held on to her Qualcomm stock and then it split and it split again and she had so much and then she sold it. <laughs> she made more money than she would make in her entire lifetime because of one thing happened and she had reason to believe, with that not in start training, well, she knew a lot of people who worked there said, you know, don't sell your stock yet. This is a really good idea. That, that happened to a lot of people. If you have a company and they're about to go public and, and things like that and you expect that you're gonna make a lot of money, this is what's the probability of something happening? What's the probability of something happening given that you know this? That's what conditional probability is. It's not just the on the surface probability. It's the probability if you know something because the sample space is hugely affected. The last simple example I want to give you is actually life insurance. Um, many years ago, I, I took some classes at San Diego State um, just 
kind of bored out of my mind, uh, actuarial science. Now, actuarial science is a really interesting field. I, for there was a time that I actually considered going that route. An actuary, it's, it's basically a combination of math and statistics. And actuaries are employed by big companies to help them with you know, investments and things like that. But insurance in general, life insurance in particular, is the most pure form of actuarial science. The, the idea is, if you have life insurance right now, your rates are based on simply what is the probability you're still going to be around in a year. It's actually that simple. Okay, so if the probability that you're still going to be around a year from today is really, really, really high, then your rates are probably really low. If the probability you're going to be around in a year is not great because you've got some really bad habits, you know, you love to you love to skydive. You, you love to go shark tagging in the ocean. And that's just for fun. You try to find sharks and put tags on them. You're a heavy drinker, heavy smoker. You're overweight. You know, <laughs> you got a whole bunch of things against you. Um, your insurance rates are probably going to be very high because the probability of long-term survival is very low. It's actually this simple. And what they do in the actuarial world, believe it or not, it starts off like this. The way the tables come from, they'll start with literally a million people and then next year, how many of those people are still around? And then one year later, how many of those people are still around? And on and on and on. They'll follow people. This has been going on for a really long time, you know, all last century at the very least. They're called life expectancy tables. What is the probability that a 30-year-old is going to be 31, is going to live to their 31st birthday? Well, they'd look and say, how many 30-year-olds were there on the earth or in our, in our poll? And then the next year, how many were there? Okay, the probability might be on 0.993. Now, if using this, this is how we calculate life expectancy. So you see, you hear things like this all the time in a stats class. The life expectancy of a male in the United States generally is always reported to be about 72 and females around 74. That's using really old data though. You see, if you were born today, all things being equal, is 72 or 74 reasonable? No, probably 80 at the very least because we know people are living longer each generation. So here's the thing. If you were born today, what's the probability you will live to be 80? I don't know. Maybe that probability is 0.5. Maybe that probability is 0.3. Maybe that probability is 0.2 because you got to live 80 years and survive everything. If you're 79 right now, what's the probability you're going to reach 80? Now think about this logically. If let's just say hypothetically, the probability of a person born today reaching the age of 80, let's just say it was 0.5. That might be a little bit high. If you're 79 today, is it 0.5 that you'll reach 80? No. No, it's probably 0.99. Why? Because you've already lived the first 79 years. Oh, so if I said, what's the probability that a person will reach their 79th birthday? Maybe it's 0.51. What's the probability a person will be born reaching their 80th birthday? Maybe it's 0.5. So what's the probability that a 79-year-old will reach 80? It'd be 0.5 over 0.51. Why? because they've already reached 79. In other words, it's a conditional probability. So the probability of a person reaching a certain age depends on how old they are now. That's huge because they've already lived that long. They only have to live this much longer to reach that goal. So all life insurance is based on this. Now, I don't want to get into auto insurance. That's totally different. But the idea of life insurance is that what is the probability you will reach the next age all things being equal. So if you have never gotten life insurance, one of the first things that happens when you apply is they go through a, a long interview process and a list of all your habits. <laughs> they want to know the bad habits. They want to know your health history. They, you want to know all these things. You know, if you have a terminal illness and you decide to apply for life insurance today, you're probably not going to be able to get it. And if you did, it would be outrageously expensive because the probability of living longer is not there. So conditional probability. Okay, conditional probability, all insurance rates are based on conditional probability, including auto insurance. But the idea is, what's the probability given that I know something? So the problems I've asked you to do are not really complicated. They're fairly simple notion, um, but it, it's, it's different. It's kind of fun.